videos, uh, short introduction to my algorithm. It's we have these points here, and these points are represented by this red line here. Then we make the business space, which is this screen, is maybe that's so. This is about this green line around here, the operation space we have created. Then we use this to because it into local and convex submissions. We have seen it here, we have a lot of regions. We move from it. And it is, uh, you know, very obvious here, but we are assuming a fixed uh, direction we are moving from. And we are not optimizing it, like even him talked about, but we are just assuming that the user is giving a fixed input. And we have this here, we can calculate the path, how to move between them, and then for the whole area. There's a small error in that, that error is the frustration of this is missing. You will see a better picture later and maybe what up what's wrong about this stuff one. So just This one, this uh, one shows us still some small problems with my having a missing and get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you see, it just makes a little bit too long term there. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing uh, that's under control is just need some more time on fixing the small details. But as you can see on the two videos, uh, the robot is, uh, the algorithm is able to really call the whole area without big problems. Of the edges we have. 
there are these uh, norms funneled towards the center of the <coughs> And in our case, the norm is like a vector. It has a magnitude and an angle, but in our case, uh, magnitude is not of interest. We are only interested in how the angle is. And the norm will, in the forecoming uh, part, you, know, you will see if you find a quite a useful tool <coughs> on working it. So, <coughs> now the first step is to create a vacant space. We're giving some values of the area, the boundaries of the area you want to work with. Now I want to create the Kerlin space. But why do you want this? The thing is, you can see here, good classic example, with the robot, robot here. This is a, the robot is working is, is, is point at the center of it. But due to its form, it can't go out to the boundaries we have defined. So Kerlin space is a region that defines all possible regions of the robot. And of course you say, that, but why don't we just make a region where the robot can be in? But it's not very flexible. If you define a region, a surface, or area you want to measure, it's pretty static throughout time. But if you want to use different robots, then, then it would be more flexible to just have a fixed region and then create a community space that takes care of the different robots you want to work with. And when we have the normal form of the uh, lines or the edges we work with, then uh, actually the angle is un uh, untouched or unchanged. And the only thing we need to change is actually the range we have. And in our case, if you see, uh, if you use the sample, it has some ranges. This uh, range is here. And then the aim is actually, you know, it's supposed to be the ranges we have of each edge, we just need to add or subtract them. So, how do you do that? And that's, that's actually a pretty uh, simple way. We just have the angle of our line and compare it with our norm. Normal angle is equal and just adds the radius to a line. If not, subtract it. Then, as a small note, is that we have a negative range that uh, represents a shift in our angle. All radius uh, in a normal form is defined as positive. So, if you can like, imagine that uh, there is a major coordinate system with curve here, you have xy, and you have a line here, and something is negative, it means that we have moved from a, uh, beyond an axis. So we have like an angle here is like uh, 180 degrees, and here is zero, and I have a shield. And here an example is that here we have two edges, one from zero to one, one from two to three. Both of them have an angle of zero degrees, and just the range is different, but we don't care about that. And here we have, we have the norm, this norm is one from this way, and it has an angle of zero degrees while this one has an angle of 180 degrees. So in this case here, we will move this line in this direction here, and move this one here in this direction here, and thus create into the business space. And you've seen all this already, but here is a larger picture of how the creative space is created by a very simple but yet powerful algorithm. So next step is subdividing Polycom. And our aim is to ensure that the uh, <coughs> Polycom is locally subdivided, locally convex. What I mean by locally convex is that we have no change in connectivity and connectivity at a specific direction. That means you can, like, for example, here, you're moving up and down in a particular direction, and you move slowly. Suddenly, you encounter an obstacle here. It chooses the robot to choose while moving to the right or the left. Of course, we can just have an algorithm that just chooses and works on it, but it will be a lot more simple, a lot more simple to just decompose it, have it like you go command app. Yeah. Uh, you're just splitting it into smaller parts that is very easy to process and to try to make things more simple. So, the aim of this algorithm here is to ensure who said <laughs> So, uh, the aim is just to survive the program until all these, these parts we have are we should be loading the convex. So, how do we do this? Well, as we said, the changes in connectivity only occurs at the vertices. So, what we do is we create a line through the vertex as the direct, uh, position direction we are defined by the user or the user has defined. 
So that is determining the closest section on both sides of the line with the vertex as the center point. Of course, if you have only one intersection at one side, then we have no change of unity and you just keep on. In this case here, we have two intersections. Is that enough to ensure that we have a change of unity? No. As you can see here, this side part here is inside the boundaries of the polygon, but for this one here, it is actually outside, making it not valid. So actually, we need a way to determine whether the line from the vertex to each of the intersections is outside or inside the boundaries of the polygon. And again, the norm is coming to our rescue. The norm of uh, the line is intersecting an edge. And to use the uh, edge of that uh, norm, to use the norm of that edge in the intersects to determine whether it's outside or inside the boundaries. And there are also cases where it's an intersect, intersect a vertex, and for this one, we just use the average of the neighboring ed uh, edges around it. And we can well, we assume that, we go back here, we have, that we just, that we can assume that the edge is pointing directly towards. A norm that point, uh, point, ah. We have a norm uh, pointing directly towards the vertex. Of course, we can assume it's within, but there are also some ranges. And if the norm is pointing directly towards the vertex or within a range of plus minus uh, RP, which is 90 degrees, then it's inside the boundaries. So if you look back and we extend this idea, to the first picture, we have this here, and we see we have boundaries here, and the boundaries here. In this case here, the norm is within range, but in this case it's not. So we don't have to change connectivity here, even though we have intersections of both sides. We can imagine instead we have a line, line going through here, boundaries are still the same, and we see that we still have the same edge here, and intersection, but instead we intersect this one here, and we have a norm on in this direction, and we will obviously be within, within the boundaries uh, range, and then we have defined a change of connectivity. And when, when this happens, we are uh, dividing the polygon into three parts, and these two parts are then processed again with the same algorithm until everyone can confirm to have no changes in connectivity. And we have the results here. Um, we have an angle around 100, uh, 0 0.8 uh, radian to around 45 degrees. And we see all this here, uh, moving in this direction here. We have no change connectivity for each subpart. And when we have this here, we need to figure out how to actually process each, how to move to through, through each subpolygon. And here, uh, it's not really shown, but it's shown. It's so it's on a video, we have a starting point of the robot. So what we're doing is we have a starting point of the robot, we need to figure out which top token is closest to the robot. And you use that as a pattern and then perform a simple step first search. Like I said, the robot is here, and we move here, and we move here. Of course, we can choose here the algorithm uh, at the moment we can it's not very intelligent, so you maybe just go through here, here. Back here, up here, through here, there. And it's moving there. And when we have this plan here about how to move to the subcontent, then we can just use the slow algorithm to figure out how to process it. So now you can notice it yet, but unlike the picture is so picture is so before, then the line was coming from here, but actually now it's coming here. Because other problems is that we don't process the regions twice, but still the a, our algorithm that tries to figure out how to move through the subcontents, we will need to go back. And we, so instead of just processing once again, we just skip it and move to the next one. So when we are moving from here to over here, instead of just moving up there and there, we just move directly. But yeah, we see, and it goes outside range, so we need some kind of automation tools which are implemented in order to ensure that the pattern is always inside the boundaries of the polygon. And, and I think I will leave you 
we have for now. And the conclusion is that the reaction can be executed with cocktail pen on a wide variety of shapes. As you also saw in the video, then there are still some few things missing, but it is under good progress. At least it's getting better, better, more time. And there's improvements. Of course, we, have, we need to handle obstacles. We have static and dark uh, uh, <coughs> obstacles. And we can use, we can also try to add obstacles at one time. There's a researcher called Eka Luke Aka, who has done a lot of research on this and has some excellent articles about it. So let's try to find an optimal drive direction and use curve tracks, which have Ibrahim had also put it on. And um, yeah, some thanks is to uh, Kira Rasmus for the support and the uh, yeah, opportunity, uh, opportunity to get into this presentation. And then even him for his uh, knowledge he shared with me. <coughs> and also Martin who made this video here. I couldn't see the most important of it, but when I saw the result, and I thought, well, why not? So yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>